Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome everybody to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. It is a great day to be alive and I'm so excited about my guest who is also a really good friend. So you're going to love her. Uh, before I hop into that though, I want to invite you to join us in the Secret Sauce Group. That's where we're, we are recording this live in the Secret Sauce Group on Facebook. So uh, don't miss out. You can actually ask questions there. You can comment. You can hear it live. Um, and it's just a great place to hang out if you struggle with food and weight. So you go to Facebook, you type in Secret Sauce to End Emotional Eating, and boom, you're with us in the Secret Sauce Group traveling arm in arm, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder with other emotional eaters, because guess what? That's what it takes. Nobody can do this alone. It's impossible. So, um, you know, the, the struggle with food and weight goes too deep. Um, you know, we've been working at it too long. Uh, it's way entrenched. It's the hardest of all addictions to overcome, in my opinion, because you got to eat, right? You can't put the plug in the jug. So definitely get support by joining us at the Secret Sauce Group. And also, if you're not sure if you're an emotional eater, like you've heard that, uh, those words and you're like, I don't know, you can take a quiz on my website and actually find out for sure. You can get a personalized score. So go to healyourhunger.com and take the quiz. It takes like three minutes, but find out if you're an emotional eater or a food addict or somewhere in between. Okay. Okay. So on with the show, I'm so excited about my guest, uh, Dr. Tracy McCarthy. Now, uh, uh, Dr. McCarthy is a board certified psychiatrist and functional medicine physician, and she specializes in helping people with anxiety, depression, and gut issues. So if you have anything around that, which I find most emotional eaters have at least one of those three, um, then you're in the right place. And I think you'll really enjoy this show. Um, Dr. McCarthy uh, practices in Sacramento, but she also has a virtual group program as well. So anybody around the world can uh, access her expertise and amazing guidance on just getting healthy. So uh, welcome, Dr. Tracy McCarthy. So glad that you're here. Thank you, Tricia. So excited to be here. Yeah, it's awesome. And look at us, our purple and our blue. I think we I look know. great. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's really, I mean, you're just, you're such a dear person, um, you know, but I know you're an amazing physician and, um, and I, I think this is such an important topic because emotional eaters do suffer with so much anxiety and it drives emotional eating and as does depression. And I know there's a HP access and some things maybe we'll talk about that, you know, they go together, anxiety and depression, unfortunately, and they're definitely exacerbated with, by gut issues. And, you know, anybody who struggles with food and weight has been feeding their gut some pretty unhealthy foods. Mm -hmm. I know I did, you know, all the ooey gooey chewy foods, you know, and all all the, unfortunately, the, all the additives and chemicals that I resorted to, even though I had a lot of health consciousness, you know, when I was in that dark place of binging, I'd stop at 7-Eleven and buy their crap, you know, and I just mm -hmm. would because it was fast, easy, cheap, and it tasted really good, <laughs> but yes. I was totally trashing my body. So, um, so thanks for being here and, and for discussing this really, really important topic. Now, um, can you talk about some of the symptoms that people typically come to you for or, or you know the things they're suffering with? Yes, absolutely. So anxiety is is probably number one. Um, low mood, like depression, insomnia, um, low energy, and then a lot of um, they often have at the same time bloating or problems with um, like diarrhea or constipation, uh, just a real feeling like they just are getting kind of going in a downward spiral, actually, getting more and more symptoms mounting instead of um, feeling like they're able to get through this and get past it. And often these people have had really, they've tried traditional treatments, they've tried medications or therapy, and they're not either getting the, a good effect from the medication or it's worked, but it's had side effects. And they also know that that's a Band-Aid and they want to actually heal the root causes. Yeah. So, I mean, anybody who goes to a functional medicine doctor, I, I would presume has some good 
consciousness around health and knows that getting to the underlying causes, just like what I do with emotional eating is, exactly. is you know, getting off the diet track and getting into what's really going on. So I love that that's what you do. Um, do people typically come to you with gut issues or with anxiety and depression issues? Well, I'd say the majority come with anxiety and depression, and then they are also simultaneously having those other issues because it's all connected. I mean, yeah. very few people have pure anxiety and no other symptoms, you know, right. because there's this intimate connection between our guts and our brains. And so there's always overlapping symptoms. Totally. So, um, anxiety, you know, I, my former husband, um, you know, the thing that really drove his emotional eating and his whole demise, you know, at at one time, many, many decades ago, um, that was, uh, panic attacks that he Mm. suffered from, which sound horrible. And by the grace of God, I have never had one, but I lived with him for so many years and he had a fear of having a, like, sort of like that, like, that's how it works. Yeah. Yes. Like mm-hmm. he never wants to experience that again. It, it's been years since he has, but, mm-hmm. but it's always looming, you know, always that fear of having that, you know, that right. dreaded panic attack. So can you talk about pan- panic attacks and what those are? Yeah. Well, they are scary. I mean, they feel like you feel like you're dying. People yeah. go to the ER the first time they have one usually, and maybe other times as well, because they're worried they're having a heart attack. I mean, they can be their heart is racing or pounding, they're short of breath, it's getting worse. It is terrifying. And once people understand that it is a panic attack, they can start to get help to to not have to have it escalate. And they can realize, okay, I know I'm going to be okay. But even then, even when you know that, and you can tell yourself that, that feeling can last even for hours. I mean, Mm. it's, it's horrible. And you mentioned, you know, how it made your former husband not Um, you know, be worried all the time about having another one. That's exactly what can happen. Uh, You know, when we define in in the sort of conventional psychiatric world, we use this thing called the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. And the diagnoses are panic disorder with or without agoraphobia. And agoraphobia is that, you know, fear of going out, but it comes from that panic attack, the fear that you're going to have another one and you not wanting to be, you know, away from home or in public when that happens and people begin to restrict their activities as a result. It's really debilitating. Yeah, that's interesting. So that's where that oftentimes where the agoraphobic uh, yes. tendencies come from is I don't want to be debilitated by panic attack while I'm in public. Hence, I'm going to stay out. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm like when way. I'm when I'm away from my, you know, resources or, or whatever it is around that. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's a, it's a difficult sort of spiral. Yeah. Plus if you're a professional and you're, you know, in the workplace, or you've got mm-hmm. important meetings either on zoom or in person. Mm-hmm. You know, the last thing you want to do is come apart at the seams. So that's exactly that's why, right. Yeah. People well, want to control their environment. I was just going to mention a patient I had who came to me with panic attacks Um, and you know, she's a good example of what we were talking about. Well, do they come with anxiety or gut problems? Well, she had both. She came with chronic anxiety, but also severe panic attacks and she was on a medication for them and it had helped some enough that she stayed on the medication, but she was still having these and she had irritable bowel syndrome. So she had been someone who loved to travel and she could not get on a plane anymore because of both symptoms, right? She didn't know when she was going to have to run to the bathroom. She had to plan her life around that. And she also didn't know if she was going to have a panic attack. And when we identified all the root causes and treated those in a few months, she had no more panic attacks, no more diarrhea. She was able to to go on trips and got her life back. She was flying. So it's so great when you can get to the bottom of it. Totally. And so, but most of the time people, if they go to the doctor who's not Mm. a functional medicine doctor, they're medicated. Can you talk about the, the problems with medication? Yeah, especially with anxiety, there are a lot of problems with medication. So, you know, for some people, medication can be life-saving. I don't want to deny that, but First of all, you're right. People are not going to be getting answers about what's causing it. There's not going to be, I mean, if any, very extensive workup medically as to what the causes are. And there are some really straightforward things that can be causing that. And, um, and then the medications are usually one of two categories. They're either something called benzodiazepines, which are medications like Xanax and Ativan and Clonopin or Valium. Or there are the SSRI medications like Prozac and Lexapro, Celexa, Paxil, Zoloft, those ones. And so the, the um, benzodiazepines, they work immediately and make people feel much better, but they are addictive. Mm. 
Mm. And so what happens is you develop tolerance to them, which means that if you took, say, one milligram of Ativan and it used to help, eventually it's not helping anymore and you need a higher dose. Mm. And then you get hooked on more and more. And if you stop it suddenly, you can actually have a life-threatening withdrawal from a benzodiazepine. You can die from stopping a a high dose suddenly or medium dose, depending on your brain. So they're really serious. And they also impact people's cognition, like their memory and their thinking, and they impair your driving. I mean, they're not safe. So as an emergency, every once in a while, it can make some sense, but it's not, it, you know, people end up taking them all the time and then it just creates new problems. Right. The, the other kind, the SSRI medications, they take weeks to work and then they have a lot of side effects like loss of libido and um, loss of, like emotional numbing. A lot of people don't like that. They're saying, I, I, you know, when something sad happens, I I should be able to cry and I can't actually grieve. And so, um, and they can cause GI upset also, gut problems. So there's just a lot of issues. And again, they're not getting to the root cause. Right. And do you find, I mean, it seems like there's got to always be a root cause, right? Like anxiety doesn't just happen, does it? No, correct. It's a sign that something's wrong in the body. And I mean, there are numerous causes and usually people have multiple causes at once. Any kind of chronic symptom is rarely about the one thing that's behind it. And that's, I think, an error in thinking that we have in our conventional medical sort of approach. It's like, well, what's the cause of right. anxiety? What's the cause of autism? What's the cause of Alzheimer's? It doesn't uh, work uh, like Emotional that. eating, people do with emotional eating. It was yeah. that, one, that one day back when I was eight, you know, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> exactly, you things. know, it's all of these things you have to do together, right? And yeah. that's exactly the same case with anxiety. But it can be, certainly there are psychological factors. There's things in childhood, like, traumas, you may have heard of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, right? Mm -hmm. That can set you up for long-term anxiety because of its effect on your developing brain. And you mentioned the HPA axis, that's that connection between your brain and your adrenal glands. Um, And it changes your brain, but that's not the only factor. There's so many. So the gut bacteria growing inside your intestines impact your anxiety, your nutrient levels. I mean, in the case I was telling you about with the patient with the panic attacks, One of her big things was she had had her gallbladder removed and now she couldn't absorb any fat soluble vitamins. And this had led over time to a real lack of certain key nutrients. And that was only, that was one of the pieces of her puzzle, but it was a really important one. Wow. So let's transfer to, well, uh, yes, to the gut. And can we talk about, um, well, you're going to do the talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> Go ahead. I'm not going to say much at all. So, um, but can you talk about, you know, the gut and how intelligent it really is? Because this is kind of a new thing that we're mm-hmm. really discovering now. Yeah, it's so cool. I feel like every day there's new research coming out that shows us all the ways that the gut impacts our whole system, but particularly that gut brain connection. And it's a two way connection. So, the bacteria in our gut are making chemicals all the time, right? And their metabolites, those things are absorbed into our bloodstream and they travel to our central nervous system and interact. They make neurotransmitters like GABA and you know things like serotonin. They actually make those. And they make other th- chemical messengers that can be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, depending on which bacteria they are. And yeast, yeast can grow in the gut also and cause a whole lot of problems. And so they are making these chemicals that interact with us and they're affecting our immune system. So some of those bacteria are really triggering our immune system to to react. And that inflammation that results from a turned on immune system, that can cause anxiety and depression as well. And that's just one of the ways that the gut and the brain are communicating. There's more, I mean, there's, there's, there's several more aspects and then they keep finding out more. Like, for example, the vagus nerve, which is the longest nerve in the body, travels from the brain stem down into your gut and it, it's responsible for the gut having its, um, the motility that it has so to squeeze the food through the gut. And that actually, um, so some of these chemicals from bacteria can actually travel up through the vagus nerve back to the brain. Oh, I mean, wow. It's just crazy. There's so much interaction. This is, I'm just sort of, this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. Yeah. And we keep learning more about that. So what we have in our gut is very, very impactful. There've been studies uh, showing like mice that are anxious and mice that are not anxious. And if you switch the bacteria in those guts, the guts of those mice, 
Oh, that interest- is it like like fecal switching transplant? Or yeah, yeah, fecal microbial transplant or FMT. Yeah, those anxious mice will become calm, and the calm mice will become anxious. So the wow. gut is hugely impactful, and to not pay attention to that is really missing missing a huge part of what's driving people's anxiety. So what are the main causes of our our gut not having the right bacteria or the or things you know, like taking a turn for the worse? Yeah, what a great question. Well, for some people that can really begin at birth. Um, if you're born, for example, via C-section, that might've been a very important thing to save your life, but it had unintended consequences. You didn't get the bacteria that you were designed to get by going through the birth canal. And you get the bacteria from the staff of the hospital's hands, even with their gloves. And then there's, so the first colonization of bacteria is is the wrong stuff. And then if you're fed via formula instead of breast milk, that has an impact. There's bacteria in breast milk that are helpful. And um, antibiotics that are taken for, for example, ear infections that may not have needed antibiotics. Sometimes antibiotics are absolutely needed, but they have these unintended consequences and they kill off parts of the bacteria of our gut. And then the food, you mentioned earlier about like eating the food that you know was not helpful or healthy. Well, sugars and processed carbohydrates like flour, they really grow different bacteria than vegetables and real whole foods. And so you end up with this imbalance. You've got too many of the bad guys and not enough of the good guys. And if you don't have those healthy bacteria sending those wonderful like calming anti-inflammatory messages, your immune system is going to be imbalanced. So you wow. really, it, yeah, it's through all these different life experiences, it, the exposures, toxins play a role also. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and even stress, stress impacts our gut microbiome. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. It's How does huge. That work? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, it stress can increase the, what we call leaky gut. So mm-hmm. how um, sort of sealed off your gut is, or if, if um, toxins or undigested food particles can enter in your bloodstream, that gut leakiness is impacted by stress. And because of a variety of things, um, the, the stress can actually shift what bacteria you have present in your gut. One of those is through something called secretory IgA, which is an antibody that we make normally. And if our stress levels are really chronically high, we won't make enough of that. We won't have that first line immune, system, immune functioning in the gut that is so helpful. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is so fascinating, isn't it? Um, if somebody is like, oh my God, like I got to do something for my gut and they want to go take like a, you know, some kind of, um, uh, like a supplement. Probiotic. Oh. Yeah. Like a probiotic. Do you mm-hmm. recommend that? Well, probiotics can be very helpful. I use really specific targeted probiotics in my practice, depending on what I'm finding on stool testing and based on symptoms. But you know, a, a good, strong sort of lactobacilli, bifidobacterium blend can often be very supportive and helpful, but some people might find that it makes symptoms worse. It really depends on what's going on. So you have to kind of try things out and you need to start slow because you can yeah. kind of, it can be pretty strong. Got it. So do you do a lot of testing in your practice? You must do like that, like the poop test and all that. <laughs> yes, the stool test. I, in my one-on-one patient work, I do do quite a bit of testing. But what I have found, and the reason I've created my group program is that there are really common themes and there's so much we can actually do without testing that I can tell people are going to need just based on the presentation and the symptoms. And really? you can get so far, not everybody has to do all of that, you know, to get well, or they can get a whole lot better without yeah. that. Yeah, you know? oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, because that testing gets so expensive. And it's, you got to work with someone who actually knows, you know, which tests to get and stuff. And unfortunately, that's, you know, there's just not a lot of practitioners yet really trained well in this. Right. So if somebody's on a lot of meds, right, and they're mm. like, doc, I, you know, I'm on a lot of meds, I'm not really getting better, I'm still anxious, I'm still agoraphobic. What do you, like, how do you handle that? That's such a good question. People always want to just stop their meds and then, you know, then treat the causes. And I really don't recommend that unless you're just having extremely bad side effects to a medication, because there's this whole idea that we are trying to create a brain that's very adaptable. Really, we want to optimize the neuroplasticity, which just means how flexible your brain is. And if your brain is inflamed because of or nutrients and like and inflammatory diet and the wrong gut bacteria, it's not going to adjust well to stopping these medications that it has gotten used to. 
So coming off of medications goes much better when you first address root causes and you really lower the inflammation, you heal the gut, you replenish the nutrients, you eliminate the toxins, all the great stuff we do. Now you've got a brain that is really optimized and flexible. And now when you come off the medications, it can adjust to that. Got it. That's super cool. Um, are there foods that are a lot more damaged? I mean, obviously you mentioned sugar. Is dairy just as damaging as sugar? That's a great question too. I mean, there's sort of the category of foods that are inflammatory for everyone. And that's things like, you know, French fries, for example, things fried in a- Oh, in a, in, really? In, I know. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, and when I say that, I mean like fast food French fries, things fried in vegetable oils that are damaged. I'm not talking about frying in really, really healthy fats at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, those kind of fats are very damaging. The processed carbohydrates that we mentioned, the flours and the sugars are really, really damaging. That's mm -hmm. bad for everybody. But there right. are gray area foods, like, and dairy is a good example of that. So for many people, dairy is a problem. And okay. people always think about lactose intolerance, but it's usually the protein in dairy that's a problem, the casein protein. Okay. And that some people's immune system react to that. And as, as particularly, I'd say people with autoimmune disease, that can be an, uh, not a problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, but if people do tolerate dairy well, then it, a very healthy source, like organic, grass-fed dairy, that can be a healthy part of a, a diet for someone who doesn't react to the protein. Another example of that is something like eggs, right? Eggs can be extremely nutritious. Um, again, pastured eggs are the best ones, full of vitamins and nutrients and good fats, but some people react to the egg protein. So this is where finding food triggers and doing an elimination diet can be so helpful to see if it's a problem for you in particular. There's really not one size fits all for diet. Right. Yeah, got it. Okay. So that's, I actually didn't eat dairy for many years and I took, I took some tests, like I've done different food allergy tests and stuff. And almost always they're like, eh, no dairy for you. And it wasn't until COVID, I think it was sort of a comfort eating thing. Um, it wasn't until COVID that I'm like, you know what? I'm, well, first of all, I was cooking also, which I never really liked to do. So I was cooking more. I'm like, I got to have some cheese, you know? And so, and so now I'm back to eating dairy. So I'm just wondering, like, what am I doing to my gut right now? If, if I've done tests in the past, but I went like five years without dairy, do you suppose I might have healed myself? I was going to say it really can change. It depends. I mean, okay. yeah, absolutely. It depends on what the you know, composition of your gut bacteria is and whether or not you have leaky gut. And it's absolutely true that some foods that were a problem before can be reintroduced depending on the kind of problem you have with it before. Yeah. I tend to kind of cycle different foods mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because of that. So um, very interesting. So depression, can we talk about that? I mean, COVID, yes. COVID has Ugh. caused so many problems for both anxiety and depression for people. Yeah, and obviously suicide rates are, are sky high right now. Can you talk about uh, a little bit about depression and, and, and how people can pull out of that? And, and, and especially if they're, if they're on SSRIs and those aren't working for them. Yeah, there's, you're absolutely right. And it's so difficult right now for people. Many we can really change our vulnerability to depression, just like we can change our vulnerability to anxiety. I mean, even if we can't control some of the circumstances, right? So I mentioned earlier that depression is associated with inflammation. We know when people have depression, their inflammatory markers in their blood go up. And in fact, they respond well to an SSRI medication. Those inflammatory markers have gone down. So the medication is having some kind of anti-inflammatory effect in the people who respond to it. So the focus really with depression is to focus on infl inflammation. So things that are going to lower that would be like omega-3s in the diet, eating you know fish that are low in mercury, but high in omega-3s like salmon or wild salmon or sardines, for example, or taking a high quality fish oil supplement. That's one way that you help lower inflammation. Avoiding the inflammatory foods that we discussed is a huge one. Getting enough sleep. Sleep has a lot to do with inflammation, really trying to go to sleep at the same hours every night. And that's a whole nother topic into itself about managing light exposure and optimizing your ability to fall asleep, which can be a problem with depression for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, you know, there's, there's, there's even evidence of taking a probiotic. Certain bacteria can help if that was the, what was missing in that particular individual. Um, those are some of the um, big places to begin. I would say also the right kind of multivitamin can help. 
the, that's just part of it. And of course, it's other things, right? It's having connection to people, community. One of the things I think that's been so hard with um, COVID is lack of touch. You know, we are really designed evolutionarily to have some physical touch, even if it's just like hugging your friends and handshakes yes. sometimes. And we've, you know, you kind of have to have someone who's sort of in your bubble that yeah. you can be hugging. Like you need to, you need to be getting that contact because it really actually affects the expression of your genes and it affects your mood. So having a sense of purpose, community, and, and having some fun, play, play is important for depression. There's so many things that can make a difference. Wow. I love all those suggestions. And those are good preventative measures as well. All those oh, supplements yeah. you talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All that stuff. Um, you know, I've noticed something, this is a little bit of a squirrel off topic, but, um, but I've noticed with COVID that pe there are some older people who, um, whose cognition has declined considerably, mm -hmm. even if, even if they have some, something to do with other people, like if they're not totally isolated, but if they, if they're, they don't have the social life they had, if, you know, old, very social older people, if they're in quarantine by themselves or with just one other person, I've noticed their cognition change significantly. And I've heard some people talk about that. Have you heard about that? It makes so much sense. I mean, I, I guess I've seen that some in, in my own family to a certain degree. It is a, it is a real risk factor. And I think it's through primarily through the actions of cortisol and stress. I mean, okay. it is very stressful to lose your normal routine, right. to lose those connections. And, you know, that, that stress hormone cortisol is very inflammatory and it is linked to depression. Okay. And so it makes a lot of sense. It's linked to cognition as well. So, you know, one of the things for one of the risk factors that we work on when we're trying to prevent Alzheimer's is getting that cortisol level under control because it's damaging. It's damaging to our, um, the neurons of our hippocampus, which is where memory is stored. So it's, it's really important to control cortisol. And so it makes a lot of sense that stress of that deprivation of the contact yeah. is having a big impact on cognition. Yeah. And is that, is, is that, uh, I mean, I know some people might just be declining, right, and or going into Alzheimer's or whatever, but do you think on account of the COVID, it's re reparable? Like there's, there are ways that with supplementation or whatever, or if COVID ends and we get a lot more social again, you know, hope, you know thank you, God, let's hope, um, you know, can that come back? Well, Dr. Dale Bredesen is a wonderful neurologist who's done research on preventing and reversing Alzheimer's. And I encourage anyone to read his, his book, which is um, The End of Alzheimer's. And he has a follow-up book that just came out about that. But he has shown that you can reverse Alzheimer's when you identify what these imbalances are. I mean, it's really amazing. And so I, would, I always hold out hope again, that we can improve that neuroplasticity. And I mean, there's limits to how much improvement can be made depending on how advanced someone's symptoms are. But if a major issue is the stress and that stress can be changed and you can work on making sure that all the other, um, you know, inputs that matter, like the vitamin D and the inflammatory markers and making sure that the nutrition is there. And you know, it's a long list, right? But yeah. if, if those are worked on, I think there's a lot of hope. I love that. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Um, so can you talk, well, you talked a little bit about your group program, which is, I'm so glad to hear that you're doing that, Tracy, because, um, you know, people need this help and they need it desperately, you know, and obviously, I mean, thank God we're in Z the Zoom era now where, where we can reach people. I'm, all my work mm -hmm. is, is virtual as well, um, you know, uh, helping emotional leaders across the globe. So I love mm -hmm. that you are doing that and helping people that way. How can people learn about your work that you're doing? Yes, yeah, so they can always go to my practice website, first of all, which is, it, my practice is Catalyst Health Center for Functional Medicine or okay. catalysthealthcfm.com. And, you know, if there's a lot of wonderful guides there to download, to download anything, you'll be on our newsletter list. And then I can, um, you'll, you'll be contacted about upcoming opportunities for a group program when those and we'll, launch. And we'll put that just FYI for people um, tuning in. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Yes. So we are, um, when the group, when the group's launched, then we can, we contact everybody about that opportunity coming out. And then I'm also on Facebook. Um, you can find me at, um, if you search Catalyst Health again, and Dr. Tracy McCarthy, you'll find me. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for this amazing work and the, the information that you've shared today. It really sheds light on, I think, a lot of questions people have if they're suffering. Um, don't suffer, you know, get help. Exactly. Is, it's too important. Um, I have one final question that I always ask my, um, my, the people who come on my show, which is, of course, the Heal Your Hunger show. So the question is apt, is apt and it is, what is your deepest hunger? Ooh, wow. Well, you know, I think you hit on it earlier when you talked about so many people need this, this information. And, you know, in my one-on-one -on -one work, it's really limited to how much time is in my schedule, right? And it's just scratching the surface. And so my, the, the whole thing that's driven me since I learned about nutrition and lifestyle and how much I could do that was beyond my regular conventional medical training I was like, this is why I actually went into medicine, right? To really help yes. people heal. So for me, I'm passionate about people knowing this and it makes me crazy that it's not known, that you mm -hmm. can do so much to get better and you just need to give your body the things it wants and get out of its way. And so my hunger is that people learn this and I spread this information to them and they can use this to feel better. I love it. And you're doing it and you, and you're such a healthy, vibrant, beautiful woman. So you're a great example Thanks, of yeah, what, you know, <laughs> practicing what you preach. So uh, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to have you. And thanks everybody for tuning in for another episode and uh, definitely reach out to Dr. McCarthy if you're struggling because she can help. So thanks everybody. We'll see you on the next show. And thank you, Tracy. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.